I always have to remember to unmute myself. That's really helpful. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times everybody's done that probably in the past three weeks. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for attending our session. Uh, this is creating portable student uh, support for writing and math, um, how to help faculty embed student support services into their courses. Uh, my name is David Becker. I am the QM lead coordinator in the Office of Collaborative Academic Programs um, at Indiana University. And Mitchell, I'll have you introduce yourself. I am Mitchell Farmer. I'm assistant director of our campus partner programs in the Office of Online Education. And at Indiana University, the Office of Collaborative Academic Programs works very, very closely with the Office of uh, Online Education. So uh, we're going to start today with um, kind of two poll questions. Um, but what I'm going to have you do instead of kind of go to a different website is um, if the question applies to you, I'm going to have you use the little raise hand feature down um, at the very bottom of your Zoom screen. You should see a little hand that says raise hand. Um, so the first question is, how many of you would have attended this session pre-pandemic? So if this pandemic wasn't going on, would you have attended this session? Okay. Let's see one hand so far. I'll give folks a, a few seconds to respond. Okay, a few folks. Um, and that leads me to my next question. <laughs> How many of you are here to figure out new ways to provide student services during the pandemic? Many, many, many more hands. Okay, gotcha. So that kind of helps uh, us kind of contextualize who our audience is and, and kind of best tailor that to, to your specific needs. So we will go ahead and get started. And Mitchell, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, so thanks, David. I'm going to start by giving some uh, just kind of quick organizational context about how we're set up here at Indiana University and our Office of Online Education. Um, so Real quick kind of level setting, uh, give you a sense of our kind of scope of our operation. Uh, we, along with a lot of institutions, count our online students in different ways. Um, and so I wanted to put up this kind of quick infographic to give you a sense of what our spring enrollments have looked like um, so far. And we really look at students in three different groups. Uh, we look at students in online programs, students with 100% online schedules, and students taking at least one online course. Um, and those numbers are all up on your screen. So we have about 6,000 students in online programs. That means they have an official DE plan code in our university system. We have 8,500 students that are officially or unofficially taking a fully online schedule. So that includes the 6,000 that I just talked about. Um, and then an additional 2,500 students that have kind of just decided that they're better off taking all their classes online for their particular circumstance. And then at this point, um, in any given semester, I should say pre-COVID, um, we had about 37% um, of all IU students system-wide were taking at least one online course, so that would translate to about 32,000 students in the spring semester. Um, but we now at this point have um, over 140 programs. We have new programs that are being approved, uh, it seems like almost weekly at this point, and that's ranging um, from associates to doctoral degrees, um, and we also have a number of undergraduate and graduate certificate programs as well. And um, I will point out, we've had a lot of up arrows recently on our enrollment, on our program development, uh, credit hours, things like that. Um, we've benefited greatly from that in our, the way our organization has built out. Um, and I think along with a lot of folks are just waiting to see what those arrows look like going forward. So move to the next slide. Um, so real quick, we are a system-wide office. Um, I work for the Office of Online Education, and I will be quick to tell you that my, Bloom my office is located on the Bloomington campus typically, but I don't work for Bloomington. I work for all seven IU campuses from where I sit. Um, and our office is charged with leadership and management and coordination of online education across the IU system. And really that translates into kind of four key functional areas from our charter. Um, compliance with state and federal re regulations, academic program development, seamless student support services, and marketing and recruitment. And I think we're probably gonna focus the most on that seamless student services um, piece, but we'll also maybe talk a little bit about program development and academic supports. 
Okay, so um, we have a system-wide office. We have seven uh, campuses, and we wanted to figure out what does our model of online education look like. Um, and really, there were kind of three possible solutions that we worked through. The first was a decentralized model, which was arguably what we already had, which was every campus, every program, every department was making its kind of own decisions about um, which programs to take online, what levels of support to offer, things like that. Um, the second model that we, I should say, kind of very briefly considered was this idea of a centralized online hub. So this idea of a virtual campus or some unit coming in and taking ownership of all online education. We did not spend a lot of time on that particular model because of um, some of the, the key things about our institution, one of which was that we knew that we wanted faculty to maintain control over the curriculum. We wanted the academic departments to maintain control over their degrees. Um, and the campuses would maintain control over the diplomas. So if you're an IU online student, um, you get the exact same diploma, the exact same uh, credential that your on-campus peers are also receiving. There's no distinction um, made between an on-campus or an online graduate. So all those factors kind of led us to look at this collaborative model and this idea of building networks around online education at IU. And that, that covers the gamut from academic program development to marketing, to recruitment, to student services. Um, and this idea that we um, have built this broader ecosystem around online education rather than one particular area owning it in whole. So we'll move on and um, I'm gonna let David talk about one of our key collaborations here. I think I have the keyboard shortcuts down and then I don't. So um, one of our, our key collaborators in um, particularly in building online degree programs is um, e-learning des and design services. Um, so they provide instructional design and technology support to really foster um, really high quality interactive um, learning experiences for students. Um, I'll kind of give one really uh, quick example in our, um, our Bachelor of Science uh, Medical Imaging Technology program. Uh, they, the faculty in that program worked really closely with the instructional designers in EDS um, to build uh, what they called Poor Pete. Um, poor Pete is a, um, a, a really poor uh, fortuned uh, patient who gets various sorts of ailments. Um, and it's essentially like a case study kind of activity that students engage with via a discussion forum. Um, so every week or two, poor Pete has different ailments that the students then have to take those symptoms, diagnose, and then offer um, potential treatments. Um, so that's kind of one example of kind of that, that high quality interactive and engaging uh, learning experience. Uh, but they also support faculty development with um, general aspects of, of good teaching. Um, so they, they do promote uh, the Quality Matters rubric and, and helping faculty uh, meet those standards during the course build. Um, they emphasize accessibility for all students in the course design as the course is being built. Um, but they also support questions of pedagogy that, that faculty may have. Um, as Mitchell mentioned, um, a lot of our offices, including mine, um, work in that collaborative model. Uh, so we may have faculty coming in to teach online who have never taught online before, um, who, are, who have never had the direct level of support that EDS is able to provide in building their online classes. So they kind of have the opportunity to go into some, some depth about, um, you know, here's this really cool thing that I, I would do in my face-to-face -face class, but I don't know how I could do that in my online class. Um, so they help them uh, kind of address those, those pedagogical um, issues as well. Um, EDS is, is located on uh, both the Bloomington campus and the IUPUI campus, but they all, they, just like all of us, we serve all Indiana University faculty on um, all seven campuses and at all degree levels. So whether it be an associate's, uh, an undergrad uh, degree, or you know, a, a master's or a doctorate. Um, and they also support the, our development of non-credit uh, coursework that we offer through IU Expand. So really, the kind of the result of, of all of this is that it, it helps improve the student experience, um, particularly in working with EDS. Uh, so a lot of the uh, programs have developed their own um, kind of branded course design templates um, so that they're consistent across the program. Um, I think that definitely helps improve the student experience and just being able to find the things that they need to find to learn, um, but also through that kind of expertise in, in course design um, and delivery, 
it creates some efficiencies for faculty. It creates some efficiencies for the university as a whole to have this team that's dedicated to, to supporting these faculty built as courses. Um, but it also fosters that active uh, collaboration between um, both the academic uh, side of the house, but also the student support stakeholders within the university. And this is kind of really where uh, Quality Matters comes into this whole process. Um, we always kind of try to strive to look for ways that uh, we can make it easier for faculty to meet um, General Standard 7, um, but also ensure that other parts of the university keep the, the Quality Matters rubric in mind as we develop student-focused services. So as we know, uh, General Standard 7 is focused toward learner support. It really asks us to think about um, how we provide resources like um, information and access to you know offices of, of student disabilities um, how we ensure that students have the technology support that um, that they need as and especially you know, I teach an online writing course we want to ensure that they have access to the tutoring that they need um, and there are kind of four specific review standards that are that are in that that larger general standard. Um, so 7.1, we, we're looking for, you know, uh, how to uh, obtain technical support, um, institutions accessibility policies, and 7.2 uh, instructions for um, how to access academic support services and resources that will help learners in the course. Uh, and then we're looking for um, access to student services. And that's, you know, not just paying our bursar bill or um, some of the more, I think, mundane things, about student services, but providing those those really supportive structures that are in place as well, and ensuring that, um, especially in, in our unique situation where we're providing all of those services across seven different campuses, across seven different cultures. So Mitchell, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, okay, so um, as we start to move into the discussion about kind of these, the portability of these services, I want to let you know where we started and, and David was kind earlier in his framing of saying that there are different parts of the university that don't know much about QM um, and coming from the student services side of things uh, I was one of those people I had kind of heard it roughly mentioned at some point in a meeting with faculty I assumed it was something to do with instruction and I kind of wrote it off um, because that's not my corner of the world um, so I started working with uh, e-learning and design services on this onboarding and orientation experience for our online programs and when we think about orientation and onboarding, um, we kind of had this typical expectation that there's going to be this nice little glossy packet that goes out to a new freshman that says, congratulations, you did it. I, you said yes in our case. Um, at some point over the summer, you're going to progress through this orientation. Uh, you're likely going to come to campus for a visit in order to get you ready to be here in the fall to walk through those sample gates, which is kind of our like photo finish uh, for, a, for a newly admitted student coming in. That's that picturesque storybook moment. Um, so we started to think about what does that look like in the online space? And so um, if you move to the next slide, David, we just thought, okay, um, what we need to do is the students are still going to get their admissions decision. Um, we're still going to want them to go through orientation and onboarding. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just put this course in the middle uh, for their virtual journey from their IU said yes moment to their virtual campus, which will be Canvas. Um, so we put this into place and we thought, okay, great. We've done it. We put some resources out. Um, but we started to look at the way the students were using the site. We realized pretty quickly that um, unlike a face-to-face -face orientation, which is a couple days where you come to campus and, a, and have the snapshot experience, our students were coming back into orientation, uh, the orientation site in week two, week four, week six, to try to find resources that they knew were living there. And that kind of evolved our thinking as we moved into version two. Um, which was that we kind of needed to start um, thinking about this more broadly. So uh, I, I got a little ahead of myself. So we, we did build this in the LMS. Um, again, we wanted to serve multiple campuses. Uh, we knew at the outset that we would have to move in phases um, because there was no existing resource. So our version one launched in about six months. Um, and it's a whole separate presentation to kind of talk through that workflow process. But so we moved really fast. We knew that we wouldn't have covered everything that students would want to see, but they also started to use it in a different way than we had expected. And so we started to move to these other um, versions of orientation and there's screen caps along the way. But I'm going to let David talk to you a little bit about um, how we started to align those onboarding sites with QM um, through our work with EDS.
So yes, uh, and Mitchell, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I know EDS kind of in, in the second iteration kind of introduced QM in, into this process and, and wanted to align it a little bit more with the rubric. But I think one thing that probably pointed you all to that was those various resources that students kind of kept coming back to. Um, so in version two, um, the collaboration between EDS and um, in Mitchell's office is they really wanted to um, introduce the purpose and provide a kind of a, a self-paced kind of path, I guess. You could frame it that way um, for students. So this goes you know, beyond you know, general standard point seven or general standard seven, right? We're, we're looking at introducing students to the purpose of, of why they're here, what they're being asked to do, um, and why this sort of information is important. Um, and then also to emphasize those learning objectives that are, um, that are placed throughout the onboarding site. Um, and then finally, too, I really identify uh, what student services are available and um, what learner supports we could put into that, that kind of version two of the, of the onboarding. Um, so the outline required proficiencies um, and tools. So what students needed to have in order to successfully um, not just kind of complete the onboarding, but to be successful in their online classes overall. Um, really important to kind of <laughs> obviously let them know like you may need X or Y piece of software and this is how you use it. And if you're not sure, this is where you can find help. Um, but also provide accessible content. Um, it's it's not always the at the forefront of your mind when you when you're designing something new, um, but especially to uh, to better engage those students who may uh, you know require a screen reader to to access material. Um, we you know we find that our our student with disability population is is continuously in flux, but typically increasing, um, and and more and more. Um, uh, students with disabilities would like to take an online course. Um, it, it fits their their schedule. Um, it fits their um, their lifestyle a little bit more than than a face to face class might. Um, so, coming up with this version to really start to to align that a lot more with with the QM rubric and um, as you can see here in the the GIF on the side, it, it looks a lot cleaner. It, it, it's got an improved UI. Uh, but there's a lot kind of going on under the hood as well to to help students. I, I like that you used GIF with the soft G instead of the GIF with the hard. <laughs> David, um, it's it's an argument in our house, but <laughs> so um, to kind of further tell on myself a little bit more, so. Um, our instructional design team, and this is one of my tips that I share with my student services colleagues all the time, is even if you don't envision yourself having something persistent that lives in your LMS for a long time. Um, yeah, I agree, Charles. GIF is for peanut butter. Uh, <laughs> that, um, that it's really helpful to uh, at least engage in casual conversation with your instructional designers um, to see and other pedagogy folks to see what tips they might offer you. Because I, I describe it as a happy accident that QM was incorporated into our orientation resources in the first place. It is all credit to our instructional design team. I had not heard of the QM standards until one of our graduate students said we should put in a proposal to a QM conference because our onboarding uses these standards. And I said, no, they didn't. Um, and they said, yes, we did. Let's go through and look at all these things that are already incorporated. So because people smarter than me knew to put these requirements in um, as we built things out, it allowed us to um, get flexible and get portable with the content that we've built. And that's where we're gonna move into these kind of quick case studies for um, from the student services side. I say that kind of uh, a little bit tongue in cheek because we should be uh, more fully integrated than we often are. So the tightening of the QM alignment and onboarding and orientation resources really enabled us to do three kind of quick projects that we might not otherwise have been able to do. Um, the first is this creation of a non-credit academic support course. Um, and I think you're gonna have to double tap on that because it's gonna get bold. And then we'll move on to the next slide, David. Um, so this was a quick um, project that David and I collaborated on. Um, one of the things he's been working on uh, more largely at the university is this idea of a kind of pre-populated QM ready syllabus template for a course. So for a faculty member that might not be going for full QM certification, um, this syllabus template will still help them achieve uh, a lot of the QM standards that we would want to see in a course generally. 
Um, and if you go back to kind of principles of universal design, et cetera, um, doing things well at the outset helps all of your audiences, even if you're not necessarily, um, uh, accessibility is a good example. Captioning your courses, your videos um, helps everybody because if you're a commuter and you can't listen to the audio, you can read your screen. There's all kinds of different ways that it's helpful. So even if you're not going for a full QM certification for a resource or a, or a course, those design principles are still helpful to your general learner. So uh, in this instance, we were able to pull out four existing modules from our orientation and onboarding resources, um, the Mass Support Center module, Writing Support Center, Library, and Accommodations, and package those as a tailored academic support uh, self-enroll course that faculty could point to directly out of either David's syllabus template or their own syllabus template. They could just insert a link that says, if you need help finding academic supports as an online learner, go here. I think you're back. You kind of. Oh, did I freeze? Okay, move. Yeah, just move. a little bit. Okay, we'll gotcha. move to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, and again with the double, the double click because I got fancy on you. Uh, <laughs> So the next project that we worked on was uh, portable math and writing support modules, and that's kind of the in the title here. Um, and our math and writing services are asynchronous. Um, tutoring services that are available to students enrolled in online courses at our university. So uh, we have our math mentors and our writing consultants. We say consistently, we are not an answering service, um, but we do help students actually work through their real course problems. So um, on the math side, you're required to upload an example of um, the, the problem that you're working on, evidence of your own work, and then the math mentor will give you a like problem and you'll work through it together in an asynchronous format. On the writing, on the writing side, um, undergrads can submit up to 20 pages per day, or sorry, 10 pages per day. Graduate students can submit 20 pages per day. And that'll go everything from comma slices to thesis statements. Um, and the students are able to do this asynchronously. This differs from the supports that our campuses offer typically. Um, certainly on a face-to-face -face environment, the student's gonna walk into a center and get a, a walk-in appointment. Other campuses were doing um, live uh, virtual sessions. This is an asynchronous format, so it's available 24-7 to the student. They can submit their work. The coach or mentor can respond whenever they have time and go back and forth. Um, and interestingly, our turnaround time on a paper, for example, uh, is is under 24 hours and a math assignment is under 12 hours. Um, and what we find is that students will get notification on their phone that their assignment is ready for a review and then they'll come back two or three days later to get it. So um, we know that there is some demand for this kind of asynchronous format. So what we did with these services in order to kind of get the word out more broadly is on the next slide, um, we just made a really basic and we're, we're planning to go back and kind of uh, pretty this up with more graphics, a really basic portable sheet that faculty can just drop in their course. If you teach a math course that's uh, up to Calc, um, I think it's up to Calc 1, uh, you can just drop this in your, in your site. You don't have to do anything to learn about the math center yourself. You just pull this into your course. All the information's there. It explains what students have access to, how they access it, who's going to be helping them. Uh, on the writing side, that's obviously a much broader audience because if you're talking about just written papers, um, that spans a whole lot of different disciplines. Um, and in fact, I think one of the highest utilizations in the writing center is our nursing program. So we get students from all over. Um, but again, this is a way to say to faculty, you can connect this academic resource in your course without having to do a heavy lift. You just have to pull it in from Commons. Um, we also have put um, sample math course into our uh, course test drive experience, which is really aimed for prospective students. Um, but we find a lot of admitted students, especially uh, right now as we transition to remote learning, a lot of face-to-face -face students went into that test drive experience to get a sense of what an online math course might look like for them. Um, and then we're also looking at bridge courses as well for students that are newly admitted but might need um, you know, refreshers and math and things like that. And all of those things we're gonna to try to make easily accessible from the student's course them, so they don't have to go six different places to find resources. So on the next slide, we show a little bit about uh, utilization trends here. A couple of things to just be completely transparent on the statistics. Um, we made a lot of changes on each one of these years. So it's not 
solely um, due to the supportable modules. Um, we expanded the, the pool of students that was eligible to use the service. Um, we started to roll out these portable modules. We started to include this information in our onboarding resources around 17, 18. Um, and then towards the end of 19, we started to actively use uh, our CRM to target students that were enrolled in these courses as well. Um, again, not having to ask their faculty member to send out a message about these services, but actually targeting the students based on their enrollment. And then on the writing side, on the next slide, uh, you'll see some similar uh, growth as well. And it, it, the same rules apply. We added broader audiences, more modules, more CRM work. Um, but you can see that we get pretty heavy traffic in the fall. And I will, um, especially, but I will tell you that I just got off a meeting with our math and writing centers um, and talking a little bit about post COVID traffic. Um, both of them are seeing record utilization rates. Um, and we did not open those services up to face to face students. We only opened it up to students that are enrolled in an online course. So um, students are flowing into those resources online and they are finding their way in when they might not have otherwise taken advantage of some of those resources pre COVID, which I think is an interesting kind of data point. I don't know what it means yet. It's just kind of interesting. And then our last, oh, sorry, satisfaction. Students are happy. That's always a good thing, right? Um, we want them to be happy with math support and writing support. And you can see on a four point scale, um, we're doing pretty well, I think. Um, in terms of student satisfaction. And we're also mapping GPA outcomes and some things like that, but I didn't put those up on these slides. Um, and then I'll move to our, kind of our last quick case study, which is our supplemental instruction template. So this takes this idea of portability kind of one step further, and it actually brought a face-to-face -face academic support um, from one of our campuses into the online environment where it had not been before. So I don't know, I'm hoping that some of you may be familiar with supplemental instruction, but it's an internationally recognized uh, peer led student support system for courses and typically depends on the institution you talk to. I heard, I heard this framing, which I liked a lot, which was historically difficult courses, um, instead of saying courses with a high DFW rate. Uh, <laughs> because it was pointed out that some courses have high DFW rates by design. Things like engineering uh, courses are gonna look a lot different than um, you know, an intro English course, for example, potentially. Um, so historically difficult courses, and the idea is that you embed um, a faculty selected university trained peer mentor who has previously taken that course and performed well back in with the students that are currently going through it. So we took an SI model that was um, very robust and very active in the face-to-face -face contest context and ask them, can you envision a scenario where you move online and not just move online, but embed directly into a faculty member's course? And this led us to the supplemental instruction pilot. So um, how it works is that the SI leaders plan and hold uh, sessions weekly through Zoom in consultation with the faculty member in that course. So the faculty member and the SI leader are planning additional curriculum to add on top of uh, what the faculty member is delivering in the course. And one key difference in our context, at least, is the vast majority of our online courses are asynchronous. Um, and this SI component is live. Um, it's recorded and available to students after the fact, but I think the idea is that students will get the most out of it if they're in the live session. So the SI leaders are in Canvas as um, a TA role because we don't have an SI role in our LMS uh, as of right now. All of the SI leaders are trained with the same agenda and expectations. Um, they're expected to hold the same number of sessions. They're expected to record them and post them into Canvas for students who can't attend the live sessions. And then they're also expected to provide asynchronous support to the students. So this is somewhat complementary to the math and writing support services that we're offering because a lot of the courses with SI um, are some of the same courses that students are coming from for the asynchronous math and writing support. But this is kind of a live academic support that's embedded in the course. And I'll give you a little, sneak peek of the, the shell. And so what we've done is created a, an easy to port module for the faculty member. And you, if, if we were on a big screen, you'd be able to see on that um, right hand, I'm, one of the sides of the slide, there's a whole list of unpublished uh, content from Canvas. Thank you, David. Um, where it tells the faculty member exactly, ah, we're going forward, exactly which parts are just background information on how to use it and which parts are public facing for students. And then um, on the other side of the slide, you can see kind of the forward facing uh, view for students. The idea is that we wanted to give uh, our SI leaders a consistent shell, a consistent template so that students were getting the same SI experience regardless of which course or which, um, 
SI leader they had. And also we wanted the faculty to know exactly what was going to get embedded in their course because anytime we touch uh, a faculty's course design, they're going to want to know what are you messing with. So um, we'll move on to the some statistics about our SI. And I think there's a little bit of self-selection going on here. If I'm honest, students that are concerned about their performance opting into you know live sessions, you're likely to have students that um, are already doing a little bit better academically, but there is a difference in GPA from students attending versus not attending. Um, and our attendance rate in SI is about 38%, and I'm told by the SI leaders that that's actually above the target that SI sets nationally for participation rate. So we are seeing higher rates of online participation in SI than on-campus participation. And uh, again, students seem to be fairly satisfied with, with the SI experience overall. So in summary, um, our, again, the people who were smarter than me that thought about QM alignment when we were building some of these additional resources really enabled us to get flexible and to create these portable academic support services for students. Um, starting with that non-credit support uh, course for faculty syllabi, then the portable math and writing support modules for uh, select courses, and then Finally, that SI template that allows us to put an SI leader in a course alongside a faculty member. Um, and those have been really, my, my son's playing with airplanes in the background, sorry. Um, those have been really important for us um, even before this COVID era, but especially leading into the COVID era um, because it's allowed us a lot of flexibility to respond to broader university needs, uh, especially for face-to-face -face students that are moving into remote learning for the first time. Um, we spun up a website called Keep Learning at IU um, that has a whole bunch of resources, including some of the ones that I just showed you that are available to students to help them understand what remote learning is going to look like for them. Um, we've also were able, with SI in particular, able to move uh, approximately, I think it was 60 sections of face-to-face -face SI into online SI seamlessly overnight, um, which was a big win for the SI leaders there as well. Um, so I'm not giving us any special credit in saying that we had all this great hindsight um, that we knew that something was going to come to change our operations and we pre-planned. It's just that the more you can think about being flexible um, and the way that you can repackage and reuse your resources, um, the more that new products you can push out and respond to university needs in normal times and then hopefully be able to be responsive to your learners when something unusual comes up like a pandemic. So I talked a lot. I'm going to pause, uh, see if David has anything to add, and then we'll open it up for any questions. Nothing necessarily to add right now, although we do have a question. Um, actually, yes, I do have something to add. Then we'll answer the question. I'm sorry. Um, Mitchell, you mentioned kind of the, the tools that we have kind of built to, to respond to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, so I thought, oh, that would be a great idea to share that. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share this on screen, but I'll also put links to this down in the chat. Um, we have two separate sites. We have one that is keeplearning.iu.edu, uh, which is student focused, uh, things that they need to know, um, guides to, to learn how to use different online learning tools, things along those lines to kind of help them make that transition. Um, but we also have one called keepteaching.iu.edu uh, um, that is more, um, more faculty focused. Um, anything you want to specify with that, Mitchell? No, I think that I think that's good. Um, and I and I figured out how to open up the Q and A window, so awesome. I can jump <laughs> jump straight into Joel's question. Um, so for the portable modules and those types of things that we talked about, um, those are LMS based. So we use Canvas, um, and we have opted in a lot of cases to put um, those modules into our self enroll portal, which is expand. I'm oh, sorry our non-credit portal, which allows self-enrollment, which is expand, um, rather than putting them in commons just for ease of uh, making it easier for people to find them. Because um, commons, from what I see, it can be a little tricky to navigate sometimes, depending, you have to get the naming convention exactly right, et cetera, to find things. Um, our math support system is, uh, the asynchronous component is third party. Um, so we use a platform called Upswing, but I'm aware that there, there are other online um, asynchronous providers. Um, we do use all of our own tutors, um, so we are not outsourcing the math mentors or the writing consultants, uh, just the platform itself. Um, but we, we do have um, resource centers on our campuses that are doing things through Zoom, um, using Qualtrics as a scheduling tool, some other things like that. So 
Um, some tools that we already have, they're, they're leveraging, and they didn't have to go out and get a third-party vendor. But for our particular math and support, writing support, we are using a third-party vendor. And then anonymous, um, faculty adoption rates. So this is always um, kind of a, a tricky question because, uh, or, or actually, I, it's not a tricky question. Um, it's one of the sticking points in our model currently. Um, and one that David's syllabus template really tries to help solve for by packaging things uh, all in one for a faculty member. We do rely heavily on faculty voluntarily adopting any of these resources. Um, we do not have kind of a uh, set of standards or requirements. Uh, a template, for example, for, uh, there we go, I'm trying to, I'm watching airplanes fly past my head and trying to answer questions. Uh, this is the new world we're in. Um, we don't have a set template that a faculty member has to use for their course. They can come to e-learning and design services for instructional design support. They can also do it on their own. Um, so we are always kind of relying on some voluntary adoption. And David works more closely with faculty on some of the QM things, so I'm going to let him chime in a little bit um, on that. But at least on the services side, we're, we're just trying to educate and get volunteers. And really the same thing goes for, for quality matters. I think particularly the culture um, here at Indiana University is very faculty driven. Um, so, and he, sorry, uh, Mitchell's example that he gave was uh, the syllabus template that I, I presented on earlier this afternoon or earlier today. Um, it is a voluntary resource. Uh, faculty are welcome to take that and incorporate it in full. They're welcome to take it and um, pull university-wide policies out of there so they don't have to worry about finding the, the correct language for that or the, the correct links, et cetera. Um, the syllabus template is a little easier to keep track of just based on where it's located. Um, I'm sure we could look at, you know, with the, the academic support modules, Mitchell, we can probably look at like, you know, enrollment, like how many people I have, have enrolled in that course, um, those sorts of things, but that may not give us the biggest picture. Um, things like the, the syllabus template, because they're linked in either Commons or um, places like Box, uh, I can keep an eye on how often they've been downloaded. Um, so those sorts of things, but that may not always be, you know, the, the best metrics as well. So yeah. Okay. Looks like we have about um, got a few minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, so at the beginning there were a lot of hands raised about people who were trying to find new ways uh, to provide supports. Um, if you didn't like what you saw or didn't get what you needed out of what you saw, feel free to ask us about something else too. We can we can talk generally just about how IU is trying to reposition resources um, beyond what we've talked about already. We do have a question in the chat for you. I guess it's more of a comment. Gotcha. See, so yeah, I recently moved from an IT position to an ID position, so this might be insightful to both sides. Working together is very helpful. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. Um, yeah, and Joel, I've heard similar things about the the difficulty when you get in, especially in the math space, um, about doing support for students because it, it does take a, a while to um, figure out how to do the all the equations and the graphs and things like that. And that's where it's been helpful that we have a third party provider that's doing that lift for us. Um, but I know that our instructional design team has not shied away from similar types of challenges. Um, I know that for one course, uh, a tie course, for example, they had to do a lot of work to get the tie to display appropriately in Canvas. Um, so if your faculty are running into those challenges, it may be a technology issue. It may just be finding somebody that um, has the experience and the time on your instructional design team to be able to offer them some, some tips. And one of the great things about our instructional design team and going back to the benefits of that highly collaborative model that we have um, is they know what everybody else is doing. So I might say I'm having a problem with X and they'll come back and say, oh yeah, three faculty members have already worked on that and here's a resource that they're happy to let you just rebrand and pull into your resource or your course. So it's a, it's a great way to find 
and overcome some of the challenges that you run into. And um, kind of on that note, we have we had a few faculty members at, at IU Southeast that I knew of in particular, but I know probably a lot of math um, faculty have some difficulty when it comes to accessibility, um, but also really getting formulas to to print in an, in an accessible way, but also um, beautiful way. Um, I can't remember if it's mathjacks.com, it, .org, whatever it may be, but um, I'm putting it here in the chat, but it's just called mathjacks. Um, I had a faculty member who worked with that pretty heavily. I think there's some uh, kind of coding knowledge prerequisite with the tool to use it really, really well. Um, but when I was working with him and in, in ensuring that the formulas on in his um, in his math course were accessible, .org, thank you. Um, so it's mathjacks.org. Um, it was pretty seamless to use and pretty easy to use, uh, particularly because Canvas has that HTML editor function um, in pretty much any tool that's there, whether it's a page, an assignment, a discussion, um, really enabled him to produce um, technically correct and also just visually more appealing to uh, uh, math formulas, um, but was also accessible to a student who you know, may need to access that, that course site via a screen reader. Um, as far as other language scripts, that's a really good question. I'm not sure, but surely there has to be something out there. Mitchell, do you? Well, so you I, was gonna, nod your head. I was going to say, um, I know people who might know. So ours, um, we have uh, folks from our Center for the Languages of the Central Asian Region that took a lot of the less commonly taught languages uh, on into online courses. Um, and so they, they may be the folks that would know whether there's a similar resource for language scripts. Um, but if you, our contact information is at the end of our slides. If you want to send me a note, um, then I'd be happy to, to make that introduction. I am getting the link for that, the slides right now. Okay. And I'm going to paste them here in the chat. There's that. Let me make sure, because that was the other question that we had in the uh, the Q and A. It's whether we could post those, and um, I'll put them up here on the screen really quick, just so you all have them. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, we so appreciate you taking time out of your day um, to attend our session and for um, all the flexibility that you all have shown in changing to this new format and for putting up with airplanes flying past my head um, and things like that. So thank you all very much. Um, and I hope that uh, the rest of your week goes well and you have a great weekend. Yes, David and Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us today and a wonderful presentation. We're now going to have a break until 3.30, so everybody has a moment to stretch your legs, grab a coffee, and I will see you all soon. Have a good afternoon. Yeah.